Good morning, North Hills. Glad to worship with you this morning. We've uh, pre-recorded this video. Uh, this is actually Friday when I'm talking because I'm joining with you live in the comments so that we can be one family, one group who are worshiping God, glorifying God this morning and joining together as his church. Remember, the church is the body of believers. And so even though we aren't gathering together in the same room, we are gathering together in heart and in spirit this morning to engage with his scriptures and then also engage in relationship with one another through these comments. So I want to encourage you to comment as we go along. You don't have to remain silent or in some way have some reverence or you know respect uh, that you would do on Sunday morning at, from the pews. You can just simply talk your way through the message today if there's a if there's a moment you like or whatever. There's also all the fun little emojis on there and you can feel free to drop those uh, emojis in as, as you go as well. So we can, we can have a conversation as we go today and, and kind of engage with the scripture in a different way, which I think will be very positive and kind of fun for us. Uh, today, we are going to continue on through Romans. We're turning to Romans chapter 15, and we are going to be looking at something about unity, two things about unity. In fact, we are going to look how the heart of God is for the unity of his people and also how the plan of God is to build unity among his people. And so we're going to read this together kind of in chunks and then break it down verse by verse. And uh, I hope that this will be a real blessing for you. But let's open together in prayer this morning before we, uh, before we dive into these scriptures. Father God, we thank you for this technology that allows us to gather together even when we might be s distanced by miles apart. Father, we thank you that in this time you are continuing to provide, even though that there is a sickness that's um, running through our community, you have provided the means for us to gather together and engage in your word and engage with each other through this technology that you've given us. That is such a blessing for us. And we acknowledge your goodness and your grace upon us and that you have given us this technology. Father, we want to pray for those who are sick. We want to lift them up to you, Lord, that you would be healing their bodies, that you would be freeing them from this sickness. And Father, I want to pray for those who are walking in uncertainty. I'm one of them, right? I feel the pressure of this. I feel the, the stress of this. And so we know that you are our security. You are our Lord. You are our Father, that you love us. And we want to lean into you in this time so that you can be our peace, and our hope, like your scriptures say. Father God, we love you. Be with us here this morning. Amen. Okay. Well, it's really cool that today's scripture in Romans 15 actually talks about peace. It actually talks about hope. And it goes back into some Old Testament prophecies about the Gentiles being brought into the family, into the kingdom of God, and that gives us hope. This was very, very relevant to me this week as I was preparing the message and reading through this um, uh, on Wednesday. It brought me to tears because God is so good and he gives us so much. And so I'm really excited to share it with you guys this morning and, uh, and unpack this together. Um, I wanted to share a thought before we start reading, though. As we talk about unity Unity of the body is the common term used within the church because it comes from scripture. And we talk a lot about being a part of God's family as a church. And a family is a really good thing. But a body is that much more closely tied together than even a family is. A body, if you remove one part, ceases to function, or at least ceases to function in a significant way. And whereas a family, sometimes they break apart and they still kind of function okay. Uh, a, a body cannot live without a heart, a mind. It can't, it can't function without a stomach, right? Like our bodies need each part to be doing its job. And I think that that really um, is important for us to remember and understand when we talk about unity because God says that we all need each other, that we all function with each other. And so that really lets us in on the heart of the Father, his emphasis, his priority on the unity of his people. Let's read uh, from Romans. We're turning to chapter 15, and we're going to read the first four, four verses together. 
Um, in Romans chapter 15, it says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. There's that word, hope. This scripture was written to the church in Rome made up of people who grew up in the Jewish faith who accepted Christ, Jesus as their, as their Lord, as Christ. And then there were Gentiles who came in to the family through faith, through faith as well, and they needed to learn to play nice together. And so Paul has been talking about our convictions last week. He's been talking about how we should act in the weeks prior to that. And now he's hammering home this idea that we are to be one, that we are to be a family, one body linked to one another, loving one another, caring for one another. And so he talks about that the weak, remember we, we covered this last week, the weak should really sacrifice for those who are uh, a little bit more immature in their faith or those who are still growing through a period, right? We all grow in different places and in different ways. And so something that we may have gone through, or well, maybe we chewed on a piece of scripture for a while or we struggled through that, that, uh, that passage or we had to grow in our faith in a certain area of our life, we shouldn't look down upon those or force those to just bend to our will or understand us if we've already been there. Instead, we are to bear with them. We are to walk with those people who haven't taken that journey yet and help them grow in their faith through the sacrifice of our own convictions, through the sacrifice of our own, our own um, comforts and stuff. And so that is a really good reminder for us to take on this morning. I think a theme that we're going to see throughout this scripture is that we are fighting for relationships instead of fighting each other. That we are fighting for relationships instead of fighting each other. And that has a ton of relevance for us here today because we're separated by space. And so we have to go through extra effort as we are with this video stuff to be in relationship with one another. We have to take extra effort to call one another on the phone, to be in relationship with one another. And so that's a challenge I have for you guys today, to continue fighting for relationships during this time when we're separated. There are tools at our disposal. There are blessings God has given us so that we can continue to be in relationship with each other. Okay? I, I want to look at verse 3 here. It says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. This was beautiful. This is a beautiful verse because what this means is that he took on our shame. He took on our guilt. When Jesus went to the cross, remember, he took on the accusations that the enemy would pile against him, would pile against us, I'm sorry. He took those upon himself. And that's an example of why we who are strong in our faith have to bear with the failings of the weak. When we look at the two parties involved in this church that, that these were written to, th there's kind of two camps, right? There's the Israelites, the Jewish believers, and then there's the Gentile believers. Both are saved by faith. But one set comes in with very firm convictions. Those are, those are the Jewish believers. They were given the law, and so these convictions to, to carry with them to help them understand their walk. But then the Gentile believers come in saved simply by grace, simply by faith. And so their convictions are not going to be as strong, but in some ways their faith might be stronger because they're simply saved by faith. They don't have to struggle against maybe some false convictions or, or poor convictions when they're trying to figure out their relationship with God. And so um, uh, I think when this passage is talking about the strong and the weak, the strong are probably more likely Gentiles in this scenario, and the weak were probably some of the Jewish believers who were kind of stuck or enslaved by some of their convictions in the man-made laws that they had intertwined with the Levitical law, the law, the, the law of the prophets that God had given them. 
And so um, they really had a, a, a large project here for them to seek unity. But Paul's encouraging them in that because that is the heart of God. That is why Jesus came to die was so that we could have unity, so that we could be saved and adopted into his family, right? But then as we're adopted into his family and others are adopted into his family, the heart of the father would be for us to all love one another, right? He doesn't want a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of kids who are fighting each other in his family. He wants unity. In verse four, it says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. The scriptures, the stories that the Jewish people carried with them, that they shared with the Gentile people, the Old Testament was for our learning. It was for our endurance. I think that this word endurance is really important because it's gonna take endurance for us to bear with each other, to walk with each other, to grow together. It's going to take time. It's going to take some, some work. It's going to take some sacrifice. It's going to take us choosing to love. But we have hope in a future in heaven where we are all together worshiping together, which means we will be in the same place. We will be standing side by side, which means we need to work on getting along now. Work towards that unity. The scriptures... They prepare us for life. The wisdom in this book is actually what's preparing us to live together. It's preparing us for the situations of life so that we can encourage one another, so that we can endure those situations, so that we can walk in truth, and so that we can understand the grace given to us and give that grace to each other. Proverbs 13, verse 4, I'm going to read from the NLT because I like the way it says it. It uses some good words. It says, lazy people want much, but get little. But those who work hard will prosper. Those who work hard in their relationships will prosper. There is, there is something to be gained through unity, through us joining together. Those who work hard in understanding the scripture will prosper. Those who work hard and diligently in reading God's word will prosper. I think this is so important because this instruction for our life helps us endure. It helps us have patience. It helps us have hope for the future. And we need that when we're betrayed by somebody that we should love. We need that when somebody's getting on our nerves who we should love. We need that when we're going to walk in grace but also be willing to share truth with those people who we are in relationship with. And so we need this scripture. And it takes... It takes work, right? Sometimes we read these, these passages, even this one that I read this week, and you get to the end of it and you're just kind of like, okay, um, what am I supposed to take from that? Where does, this, where does this go? It's not always inspiring. It's not always immediately encouraging. But if we devote the time to work on it, devote the time to discuss it and share it with other believers in our unity, then it's there for us here through the Holy Spirit to encourage us and to help give us endurance when we need it, when the time comes where life gets difficult, when there's a pandemic, we have hope. So on a little sidebar, sorry, a little, we need to be studying our scriptures. That's why we dive in verse by verse. Let's, uh, let's push on. Uh, we're going to read the next block um, uh, starting in verse 5 here. It says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. To bring praise to God. If Christ accepted us, how can we not accept each other? If we are divided and separated as a church, if we aren't living together in love, how will we ever glorify God? How will people ever know that, the, that this is the family of God if it looks like a dysfunctional family, if it's a family that's falling apart, if it's a family that's fighting against each other? They're going to run from that versus running into that. They're going to say, we don't want to follow the Lord if his followers look like this. Right? If his leading leads you into this mess, 
And so we are to seek unity because it's part of the heart of God. It's what glorifies him. And it actually will encourage us and give us endurance when we are walking with God's people, when we have one mind and one voice. This one mind kind of caused me to struggle for a minute. I had to think about that a little bit, kind of work through that a little bit and think of what, what does this one mind really mean? And I think in the context of this passage, it means that, that we have the same priority that Christ has. That is, even though I might differ in my convictions on alcohol from Jared, for example, that we both have the conviction, the shared conviction, the same mind that says unity is more important than my conviction about alcohol or unity is more important than my conviction about tattoos or unity is more, about, more important than my conviction about parenting or unity is more important than my conviction about the music style we play on Sunday mornings. We are to have one mind saying, this is a priority. Unity is a priority. Our, us being in relationship is a priority. And so I will bear with the other person. I will sacrifice for the other person so that we can live in unity together. Unity is a holy calling. Unity is an issue of God's greatness. God is great and God is magnified when his people are unified for his purposes and his glory. God is glorified to the nations when he sees, when his people unify and get together and work hard together for his glory, for loving people. We have a golden opportunity right here, church. We have a golden opportunity that there are people hurting, people stir crazy, people who feel like they they're locked up right now in their homes who are, who are you know, dying for some interaction because of the COVID-19 virus. We are the people who are investing in relationships and sticking together, right? Churches across the country and around the world are putting out content like this to engage with people. And we are calling one another. We're, we're texting one another. We're following up with one another saying, I love you. I care about you. How's it going? Is there anything I can do for you? And relationships are being strengthened and bonds are being built. Walls are breaking down. A story about me, um, I've had a really hard time connecting in my neighborhood since I moved in and I'm a very extroverted person, somebody who reaches out to his neighbors very easily. I've gone and knocked on the doors of my immediate neighbors to just say, hey, we're moving into the neighborhood. Wanted, wanted to introduce myself. And the people in my neighborhood, they're like, you know, cracking the door open, looking through the crack with the little chain across there. You know, okay, good. Nice to know you're there. Close the door. It was not a friendly reception. But over the past week, because of this virus, because of like kids being on, on spring break and staying home and not having, you know, movie theaters and restaurants and things to go do, people staying home from their, their people are staying home from their vacations that they planned. Well, now everybody in my neighborhood's like out walking around. They got to get out of their houses and they're walking around up and down the street and there's, they're now so much more desperate for human er interaction that they're ready to talk. I met uh, Ben and he has three kids and he lives about eight doors down from me and I met him down by the pool the other day and he was so excited to just meet one of his neighbors. He said he'd lived there almost three years and he knew none of his neighbors. And so he was so excited to meet me and he was actually shocked when I offered to like go buy him some groceries if he needed them. I said, if you guys get stuck, if you guys get quarantined in your home because your family's gotten sick and you guys either can't make it out of the home or you don't want to spread the virus out of your home, stay there. I said, you know, give me a call. Come knock on my door if you need to. I'm just a couple doors down. We're in condos, so they're real close together. And uh, my wife and I, we'll go, we'll go do some grocery shopping for you. That's cool. And he was shocked. And he was like... I might take you up on that. That sounds good. And, uh, and here's a bridge. Here's a bridge built, a golden opportunity that we didn't have before, an opportunity that glorifies God. Relationships glorify him. The church bonding together to say, hey, we're going to help our community glorifies God. And I hope that he'll become a part of our church someday because we want to accept people in just as we were accepted in Christ. 
Okay. Let's turn back to the, let's turn back to the scripture here. Verse 7 says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. This is like the plan, right? I said that the heart of God is unity. Well, the plan of God is also to build unity. His plan was to redeem the world. Because of our sin, we'd fallen away from God. And his plan from the start was to redeem the world. And so he made these promises to the Jewish people that he needed to honor, that he needed to fulfill, so that we would know that he is good, that we could trust him, that we could rely on him. It's part of his nature. And so Jesus Christ came to the Jewish people. If you've read through the Gospels, there's a couple of scenes where Jesus is talking to somebody, a Gentile person who has great faith, actually, in some of these scenes. And he'll, like, almost seem rude to them. Like, he's, like, pushing them aside or rejecting them a little bit. And, and it catches me off guard every time because, you know, like, I, I want to think of my Jesus as loving and accepting and things like that. Well, he had a job to do. He, he came to the Jewish people for a reason. These were the people who, who knew the truth but now needed to meet the truth. They needed to meet Jesus or else they would never have a chance to really turn to him. And so Jesus, Jesus was, was good to those people. There was one woman who approached him who had been uh, bleeding for a long time. And um, forgive me if my paraphrase messes it up. Go read your scriptures. Um, but she had been bleeding for a long time. She came to Jesus, and when she asked him to heal her, Jesus' response was like, I didn't, I didn't come for the Gentiles. I, I came to the Jewish people. And she said, she responded back to him, but like even the dogs are, are allowed the master's, the, the table scraps around the master's table. And Jesus recognized her for her faith. He commended her for her faith, and he did heal her because of, because of the faith she had. But Jesus was on a mission to the Jewish people to save the Jewish people, to, to introduce them to the truth again so that, so that they would know him. It's interesting because he came to minister to those with really, really strong convictions. And he came to honor his promise to those people in spite of them maybe not all turning to him. But his work didn't end there. It says that he came to minister to the Jews on behalf of God's truth, meaning he needed to, to honor the promises made to the patriarchs. But, moreover, can, can mean also or but, the Gentiles were going to glorify God for his mercy as well. See, the Gentiles didn't get left out because of Jesus ministering to the Jews the door was still opened by what Jesus was doing. It's really, really cool. So the next part of this, of this passage is, is really um, a bunch of Old Testament prophecies fulfilled. And for the Jewish readers of this letter, they're going to notice that the first couple prophecies are confronting them in any kind of bias they have that says that maybe they shouldn't accept their Gentile brothers and sisters into their, into their family in unity, that they shouldn't accept them and love them in unity. And so Paul's going to confront that right away with some, some prophecies fulfilled. And then he's going to remind the Jews of their hope for the future and how the Gentiles are part of that hope. So Psalm um, 18 verse 49 is the first one. It says, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and I will sing the praises of your name. I will praise you among the Gentiles. Meaning that like this writer of the Psalms knew that he was going to be worshiping alongside Gentiles, that he was going to be praising the name of God in the midst of Gentiles, that he was going to be sharing. God's plan for you to build unity was to share his, his truth, his grace, his mercy with the Gentile people. It's like he's giving us a project. 
He's giving us something to do that we are to like come together and lean on one another. In verse 10 of Romans, there's a, there's a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 32. It says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. Rejoice you Gentiles with the Jews or alongside the Jews. In Romans verse 11, it says, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. That comes from Psalm chapter 117, 117 verses 1 and 2. From Genesis to the end of the book, God is for unity. He is for all people. What I really love about the New Testament, about Jesus coming to earth, is it's like we get the producer's commentary on a DVD. I'm kind of nerdy, and uh, when I watch a movie, and I love that movie, I want to know about what they were thinking when they created it. How did this all fit together? How did you tell this story? And so you can go to the special features and there's a producer's commentary where they kind of like voice over a story and they tell you like what they were thinking behind the scenes to help you draw you into the story, to help you feel what you needed to feel at the right time and all that kind of stuff. And when Jesus comes in, he like answers all the questions. He answers all the questions from the Old Testament. And, and then throughout the New Testament now, we're kind of getting the producer's commentary on the story, on the story of God's truth and grace coming to earth for us to know, for us to experience, so that we could be in relationship with Christ, so that we could be in relationship with all of God's people, so that we could be a part of his family, the body, all connected. It's fascinating. Verse 12 says, and again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations, and in him the Gentiles will hope. This is, this is a, a kind of an end-of-time prophecy and eschatological perspective for the Jewish people, saying that the root of Jesse is, is Jesus, and he will come to rule over all the nations. We look forward to this hope as well. We Gentiles will have hope in this same story. That's what Paul's saying is that your hope, you Jewish believers, and your hope, you Gentile believers, is in the same thing. So be unified. Cling to one another. Work as a team. Love one another. And verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to read that one more time. May the God of hope, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace. I need some of that right now. As you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. My first Sunday with you guys here at North Hills, I said that I am looking forward to the kingdom. We pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, Lord. And there's this theme woven throughout scripture of faith, hope, and love. And this was a tough week, right? This was a tough week for many of us as stories of people getting sick, of economy struggling, th of being cooped up, kind of wears us all down a little bit. I felt it. I carried around stress. I didn't sleep as well. I had to keep turning back to the Lord, and there's a blessing in that. There's a blessing in being driven back to the Lord, to be driven to our knees in prayer, to seeking Him. There's definitely a blessing in that. But I got to this passage and upon first reading it, I kind of thought it was sort of, sort of weak. Eh, there's not a lot there to work with. And then I went to get the Lord in prayer, feeling what I was feeling, carrying that with me. And I'm an extrovert, and so I need people around. That's what recharges me. And, I'm, and right now I'm talking to an empty room. And, and so I'm like, Lord, I need you to charge me back up. I need you to restore my soul. I need you to fill me up with energy. I'm, I'm going to him for, for hope. I'm going to him 
to feel love. I'm going to him in faith saying, I trust you in the midst of this crisis, Lord. And all of a sudden, my eyes were opened up to the truth in the scripture. Those same words, those same concepts of where we started this journey together when I joined North Hills Church is right here in the scripture, right here in this passage. The same concepts of faith, hope, and love, these things that will endure forever are meeting me right here in this passage on a week when a lot of people feel hopeless, when a lot of people feel like we can't even trust and what these people are saying, who, how, many are, how many cases are really out there, what really is going on here? And I'm reminded, hey, you have someone you can trust in. In verse, uh, chapter 15 here, verse 5, let me read it to you again. It says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement, this may the God shows up here multiple times, may the God who gives you endurance and encouragement that God, that God is the God I put my faith in, right? I trust him, and my trust in him is what gives me endurance. My trust in him is what gives me encouragement. My faith in going to him means I am encouraged. In verse 13, chapter, chapter 15, verse 13, it says, may the God, again, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, as you put your faith in him, may he fill you with all joy and peace. I need some joy. Give me that peace. Yeah, yeah, God. And right there in the middle, let's look at verses seven and eight. It says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. This is love. This is love woven right into this verse. God's love is both truth and both grace. And God's talking to the Jews who knew the truth, who were given the law and the prophets. They knew the truth. And he's talking to the Gentiles who knew grace and he's saying, accept one another, give each other grace, remind each other, encourage each other with truth. Here's faith, hope, and love right here in this passage. We are called to love, church. We are called to have faith, to trust in the Lord, and he will give us hope. We have a hope for a future. This is not the end of the story. If you're out there in fear right now, wondering what's going to happen next. I'm telling you, you can place your hope in someone who loves you and someone who's trustworthy because he honored his promises and he sent his son out of love to take on the insults and the shame and, and the fear that you hold, to take that upon himself and die for you. We have everything we need right here, right now. We're being reminded of everything we need right here, right now. Church, this is a beautiful opportunity for us to love one another and love each other. God is right here with us, sustaining us. He is doing great and mighty things. This isn't the end of the story. This isn't uh, a forgotten part of the story where God is not present. No, he is currently at work. He is currently on the move. He is using this time. He's using this moment to draw people to himself, to draw us to each other, to help us rethink the way we do things and rethink the methods that we worship with so that we can be stronger and more unified so that we are ready to go to work on his behalf. I am in touch with some community leaders, some people in the private sector as well as um, elected officials saying, what can we do as a church? And the needs haven't risen up yet, but we, but we are in a prime moment of our story where we can connect together, where we can unify, where we can put our trust and our hope in God so that we are ready to serve when the need arises, so we're ready to step out in faith when that moment comes to be an image of his love. We stand in the context of fulfilled prophecy 
And so we have hope for eternity. Church, I want to challenge you guys to love your neighbors. Keep reaching out to people. Keep praying with people. Keep calling people to encourage them. Keep sharing with one another. Tune in to our prayer time so that we can be joining together in prayer. And we will make a difference in this community. We will love people and glorify God through our unity, through the effort we put into joining together, binding together to loving one another. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace on us. We thank you for teaching us to love. We thank you for challenging us in our unity. We thank you for fulfilling your promises, for giving us hope and peace and joy. Father, we pray that we would put our trust in you, that when we're feeling anxious, that we would lean into you. We pray that you would be tangibly tangibly present in our lives, carrying us through this tough season. And we pray that your church would shine brighter than ever, that your church would glorify you in brilliant new ways that we haven't tried before. Father, we pray that we would not be victims of this situation, but you say that we are more than conquerors, that we are your children, and that the battle is already won. Father, sustain us and give us what we need so that we can love. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray all these things. Amen. I love you guys. It's an honor to be your pastor. Keep tuning in. We're going to keep producing online content so that we can engage with you guys. And uh, we will gather together as soon as possible. I love you guys very much. Have a great week.